Uh, Jason Federico, uh, DPW Commissioner, uh, Chairman still, I guess. Ben wasn't here tonight, it's New York. Um, I'm just going to do an introduction of uh, Weston and Sampson's going to do the presentation, and then if you guys have follow up questions for us afterwards, um, we'd be more than happy to ask them, answer them. But just so you know, too, this is still draft. The numbers you see are not the final numbers by any means. Um, we're going to work to try and um, reduce the cost as much as we can uh, moving forward. But this is just the first flush uh, through, and we want to make sure you guys were kept apprised as to where we are. I'll turn it over to Jeff from Weston and Sampson. And congratulations on your uh, Thank you. winning another few years mm -hmm. on the DPW. Can you guys see okay? Do you want me to slide back a little bit? And I, I shouldn't say this, but you, if, if, if you're looking for somebody else for the, the committee, don't tell my wife, but I will throw my hat in for the center school <laughs> committee too. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> what you need is another night out. She does not get uh, local cable, so she's never going to get a call. Thank you all very much for uh, having me this evening. I wanted to provide a uh, update of the work that's been done on the Public Works Feasibility Study. And there's a couple of topics that I just wanted to touch on. Uh, initially, I wanted to start with a brief discussion on the Public Works responsibilities. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with that, but it's important that, any, that anyone that's watching uh, understand what the responsibilities are, because that really does have a major impact on the type of facility and the size of the facility. We'll talk a little bit about why the town needs a new facility, why are we actually here, why are we doing this. I'll show you some photographs, talk about how it impacts the operation. We'll get into some preliminary plans that have been developed, as well as some preliminary costs. And then we'll close with some benefits. I mean, at the end of the day, this project really does have a lot of benefits, not only for the staff, but for the community as a whole. So starting with the public works responsibilities, I could probably spend a whole meeting describing what they do on a daily basis, and I obviously won't do that this evening, but I just wanted to touch on some of the main items. And really, I think the first line says it all, where we say that the DPW touches the lives of the residents every day by maintaining the infrastructure that the community relies on. So that's everything from maintaining 115 miles of road, roadway surface repairs, puddle repairs, catch basin cleaning, to cemetery maintenance, three cemeteries. You have the tree tr uh, trimming of trees, roadside brush, removal of dead trees, to the operation and maintenance of the town's water supply. So as you look at that infrastructure, and you think about what you use on a daily basis, and everyone does that, you begin to realize that they're maintaining that infrastructure that we all rely on on a daily basis. It's also important to note that although it's a, a single operation, a single shift operation, they are on call 24 hours a day to handle all the emergencies. Everything from the obvious snow and ice removal operations, a hurricane and windstorm cleanup, a removal of road hazards, a branch comes down in the middle of the night, they're getting the call to remove that, dealing with flooding, and just general support of the emergency departments around town. Uh, in essence, Public Works is a branch of the emergency services that are offered by this community. An American Public Works reporter, they had a magazine that came out with an article that I've shown time and time again. It really says it all, and that is, Public Works are the first responders who are there until the emergency is over. So they'll get called in at the beginning of the emergency. The other emergency departments will take care of the situation, address it. Public Works is usually there doing cleanup operations. So they are really part of that emergency services that are offered. And since 2009, Homeland Security has classified Public Works as a first responder. And this is all important because as we develop concepts for this facility, our goal is to come up with something that's efficient, allowing them to get in, get to their vehicles, get to their equipment, and quickly respond to the needs of the community. So for those who have not been to the facility, why are we doing this? Why do, does the facility? A couple of key points, the existing main facility at Mattachusett Street uh, was built in the 1950s, more than 60 years old. Our responsibilities have increased significantly in that time, uh, but facility no longer meets the needs of not only the public works, but the community as a whole because of its age and its size. And this in fact impacts the efficiency of the operations as well as the safety for the staff that are working out of these facilities. Just as an example, if you look at the 1950s era equipment that was stored in this building when it was first built, you can see some example photographs on the left. It's much smaller, single-use vehicles, fit nicely in the building at the time, but you have to look at today's operation have much larger multi-use equipment doing a lot more around the community and when you take that larger equipment and you try to put it into a 1950s era building 
this is what you get. You get a lot of vehicles that are jam-packed in. One of the goals uh, of Public Works is to protect this equipment. It's a multi-million dollar investment that you've made. So having that stored inside will extend the life of that equipment. It'll make the operations more efficient. It'll reduce maintenance costs. So they do the, the best that they can to get that equipment inside. And as you see on um, the photograph on the left, the equipment has to be parked within inches of it. It's almost very difficult. Sometimes you have to climb up the passenger side door to get out of the vehicle after you park it. And if you look on the right hand side, you can see that there's just a mere inches between the front of a truck and the back of a truck, just so they can get that equipment inside, protect it, protect that investment that you have in that equipment, and make sure it's ready to respond to the needs of the community. And this photograph here again shows you just a garage full of equipment. You have plows, you have attachments, and it has to get jammed in. So you can imagine in the middle of the night if you get a call and you need something that's in the middle of that garage, it could take a half an hour to get that out to respond to that uh, emergency need. Because the facility is old and it is undersized based on today's operation, there is a large portion of this multi-million dollar fleet that does need to be stored outdoors. And as I mentioned, we've done uh, numerous case studies that have determined that by placing that equipment outdoors, it does impact the efficiency of the operation and it does reduce the life expectancy of that equipment. Uh, but because that facility can't support it, this is ultimately what you will have. Not only larger trucks, but you have some of the smaller equipment, plows, and attachments. Inside, from a staff amenities perspective, uh, they really don't exist. This is a view of the locker room slash vehicle storage area slash vehicle maintenance area. So there is no room for proper locker facilities where they have their wet gear and their daily operation. And so as a result, it ends up in the garage area. And if you move into the interior where the staff could be on call and be working for a 24, 48 hour period, this is their must room, this is their break room, this is their emergency response room at the medical facility. I actually couldn't get a better picture because the room was so small I couldn't get far enough back to get a picture to show you um, the conditions. But it's really tough. Um, they do a great job of what they have, but really these don't support efficient operations. And within the vehicle maintenance area, that is also undersized. Uh, there's inadequate um, equipment, poor ventilation, poor lighting, and generally it shares the vehicle storage area. And under today's current codes and standards, the vehicle maintenance area really should be a separate area from the vehicle maintenance area. So combination of vehicle maintenance and combination of vehicle storage creates for poor air quality and uh, inefficient operations. Uh, this is a picture of the wash bay. Uh, in fact, the wash bay doesn't exist. Um, the building doesn't have the capability to do that. And this equipment does need to be washed after storm events so that, again, it can continue to be used on a daily basis. And as a result, staff is forced to wash this equipment outdoors. Not so bad on a nice spring day, but they're doing this out in the 20 degree weather when they're trying to get that equipment ready for the next storm event. Uh, so in summary, the deficiencies, which are all important because this really plays into the programming process that we come up with and the concepts that we develop. 60-year-old building, the building itself does not comply with today's building codes. It was built for a different code, no sprinkler systems, no ADA accessibility, no fire separation. It doesn't meet the plumbing code from the toilet perspective, um, the locker shower toilet, number of fixtures, and it doesn't meet mechanical code for the air exchanges that are required in this type of facility. And all this contributes to the operational inefficiencies. So using this information, it was very valuable. We began the process of trying to come up with ideas. But as we were getting into it, one of the questions that were asked by uh, many communities, uh, they asked, well, what are the potential risks? They're doing a great job now. What if we just keep operating the way we are and keep that facility as it is? And there are real risks. We've kept an eye on the headlines over the years. And these are just some of them which we've seen for older, dilapidated buildings in 2011. Plymouth, Connecticut had a collapse of a building, crushed their trucks uh, in the middle of the winter. 2012, Hopkins in New Hampshire had a fire, no sprinkler system, lost their building and a portion of their fleet. Same thing in 2013 in Linfield, Massachusetts, and 2015 in Henrik, New Hampshire, and as recent as this past November in Tallinn, Massachusetts. Uh, they had a fire in their older building, no sprinkler system, uh, lost, sometimes this equipment can catch on fire. They lost uh, their building, they lost their fleet right before a snowstorm. So it's important to know that uh, this building is aging and we want to avoid you becoming a headline by not addressing some of those uh, issues in the older building. 
So what is proposed? That brought us to really the fun part of really understanding the operation and coming up with a program that would meet your current needs and your future needs. And what's key is we've been involved in more than 110 public works facilities in New England. So it's a great niche, we love it, but what we realize is that every community does it a little bit differently. So we spent a lot of time with the staff to interview them to understand their daily operations. We conducted site walks to observe the operations, and then we began preparing programming sketches. Every space that we heard through those staff interviews, we put on paper so that we could make sure that what we heard was translated properly into the paper form. And we sketched everything from the office areas to locker shower toilet facilities, to vehicle maintenance areas, up to that vehicle and equipment storage area. But we also really talked a lot about the operation. How, how can this facility function more efficiently? As opposed to putting 10 or 15 pieces of equipment jam-packed in, we came up and what we've used quite efficiently is the ability to drive a vehicle in, pull into a spot, hook up to a plow, back out of that spot and immediately respond to the needs of the community. And every piece of equipment would be easily accessible so that any emergency that comes up or any daily operation, that equipment could be accessed. And you have, you'll have your staff spending more time out doing work around the community as opposed to jockeying around equipment every morning or at the end of each day. As part of the programming results, what we went through is we took a look at the operations at Mattachusett Street, and we also took into consideration the DPW Water uh, Division at Collingwood Road. And I'll show you in a moment that we wanted to look at, number one, consolidating these two operations and constructing a building that would serve both of these combined. But recognizing that there has been some work done uh, at the Glenwood Road facility, uh, that there might be an opportunity to leave that portion of the operation where it is and just work on and uh, rebuild the Manakisa Street operation. So we examined both of those and we wanted to show the impact from a space perspective as well as a cost perspective uh, to help in any decision making down the road. So as part of that programming analysis, we came up and broke it out into each of the major operating areas from offices to employee facilities to the workshops, wash bay, vehicle equipment storage. And when we combined those two sites, we came up with approximately 39,400 square feet of what we call enclosed tempered space with a, a 6480 or 6,500 square foot canopy, which is just an overhang off of the building to protect the lower valley equipment from the weather. And then we pulled out the water division to see what that impact would be. And uh, we went from 39,400 square feet to roughly 32,800 square feet. And that represents about a 17% reduction in the space by leading that operation at the Glenwood Road site. As we went in and began to look at how could we construct this, where could we construct this, we went through a site selection assessment. We reviewed two potential sites, the existing Mattachusett Street site and the Town Hall Pleasant Street site. And we prepared environmental receptor maps. We wanted to understand, are there wetlands, are there floodplain issues, what would prevent that site from being developed? On the Mattachusett Street site, this is the map on the right. You can see the, the entire site shown in red. And then the highlighted area in shaded red represents the area that we would propose to redevelop. And what we determined is that that area was suitable for redevelopment, no regulatory impacts associated with developing that portion of the site. We then took a look at the Pleasant Street site, a much larger site, and as we turned on all those layers from the environmental receptor maps, you can see that the crosshatch blue is wetlands, and the shaded, I guess we'll call that an orange shade, is a 100-year floodplain, and this really restricted that upland area that we would need to develop. And ultimately, there's just a little piece in the bottom of the screen that was upland, and we determined through some layouts that that portion of the site would not be sufficient to support the programmatic requirements. So we move forward with developing alternatives on the Mattachusett Street site. This is an aerial view showing you the existing facility. And what we first did was identify an overall anticipated area that we might consider for development, just generally speaking. And we pieced each of those blocks together and came up with concepts. And this is just to show you the process that we went through. This is one of the concepts we developed that showed a bar scheme, more of a linear building. We developed a courtyard scheme, and then we developed a T scheme. And what we did is met with the staff, we reviewed the advantages and disadvantages of, of each of these concepts, and then began developing our preferred concept, essentially piecing the advantages of each of those concepts together. And we came up with two iterations. One has a single-sided um, drive-through drive uh, parking configuration, which makes a more long linear building. 
and then a second one that consolidates that a little bit. And there are three main components to this facility. Uh, our goal here is cost effective. We want to maximize your building while minimizing your cost and protect that investment and make efficient uh, operations for you. And so the main building would be a pre-engineered metal building, which are the most cost effective buildings for this application. We're using them quite a bit. This is an example of that type of structure. We would be looking to upgrade the fueling facility and also the salt storage structure. So using these cost-effective approaches, we develop cost estimates. And as we mentioned earlier, these are very early um, in nature and we are carrying contingencies because there's more work to be done. But we broke it down into what would the combined facility cost be that's taking both uh, Matakista Street and the water division operations, combining them together. And we broke it down by the major building components from the building costs of about 8.4 million. Uh, and then some of the specialty things, a lot of people will say, well, why do these cost so much? And it's important to remember that this building has a fueling facility, a wash facility, and all the vehicle maintenance equipment. That's about 1.25 million. A uh, new salt storage structure is about 630,000. Then you have your site development, which has to follow in DEP standards at about 1.2 million. And then you have your mezzanine canopy support systems. And then as I mentioned, you have your estimating contingency and escalation. And those are because of the early nature of the project. We're carrying those because there still are unknowns as you develop the concept. And that's about a million dollars. So the subtotal of the construction cost is about 13.3 million. And then you carry your soft costs. And these are all the costs that we want to make sure aren't forgotten. You have your architectural and engineering fees, uh, owner's project management fees, permitting, testing, uh, furnishings, and communications. All the costs associated with making sure you move into this building on day one. And then your contingency costs. So the grand total for the combined facility is about $16.5 million. And then we took a look at removing the water operations, that 17% reduction. And that's, uh, if you look at the total project cost at the bottom, that reduces it from 16.5 to approximately 14.5. Now, one of the items that many will ask is, is this really what these facilities cost? And as I mentioned, we've been involved in over 100 of these. And I wanted to just focus in on the cost per square foot. You can see that we're carrying a range of $338 a square foot to $357 a square foot. That's just construction costs. And what we did is we went back to the last three years that we've actually bid and or constructed these very similar facilities. You can see example photos on the bottom, pre-engineered metal building, very cost effective. And you can see that they range from $315 a square foot up to $353 a square foot. The 353 was actually on a bid opening uh, that was done about a week and a half, two weeks ago uh, for the town of Andover. Uh, so you can sense you can get a sense of what that range is and, and that range will vary depending on your site conditions whether you have ledge whether you have uh, you need deep foundations and so that explains some of the range but more importantly you know we're on the higher end of this estimate and i would expect that we would be because we're carrying a million dollars in contingency that through the design development process the hope is that you begin to whittle that down and you begin to identify your unknowns and remove those contingencies so that you move more to the middle of the pack. And I would expect, based on what we know so far, that we would see some of that reduction. So just in closing, the benefits of an improved and co-compliant facility, I mean, there's, again, I could spend another uh, whole meeting on that, but I'm just gonna touch on some of the key elements. Number one, co-compliant, safe work environment for your staff. They do a great job. Uh, they really deserve those, those types of conditions. Uh, that will help to protect the town's multi-million dollar investment in that vehicle and equipment fleet that you have. It'll result in much more efficient workspace to help the staff out doing more around the community as opposed to as opposed to moving stuff around on site. It'll improve their response times. And it eliminates the need to invest money in band-aids to a facility that really has, has exceeded its useful life and those investments really won't have any return for the community on uh, the old facility. And so with that, I turn it back over to you for questions. Yeah, could I ask about, uh, there's a $2 million difference in uh, including the water division and not including. Correct. What are, what are the pros and cons of that? So typically if the um, water division space was in as tough shape as um, the Matakisa Street site, I would say that there, there would be no, pro no pros. But what we found is that um, it's very organized uh, at that existing site. 
So um, I didn't see any issue with leaving that operation there. And due to its proximity to the Mattachista Street site, which is uh, very close, um, uh, there's still the ability to uh, coordinate operations very efficiently. Um, there's no question having everyone under one roof can improve operational efficiencies. So there's a bit of a distance there. So I'd say that's the con is having those two separate. But the, um, the water division seems to have uh, fairly good facilities right now because they've invested some. Food. Can I ask Jason uh, what 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 is your opinion about that? I personally, we we've, we've debated. We have differing opinions on the board. I would vote for all consolidated under one roof, and then find some alternative use for um, the Glenwood property. Like I said, I mentioned you know using it for some kind of a community center or nature's classroom or, or something to that effect, reusing it for some alternative use for the town or if there was any opportunity. I don't think there's any opportunity to sell it as it's, as it's part of the wellhead protection area for, for the wells out there, but I could see it being reused in some manner. It's a, it's a nice property out there um, to be reused um, in some other manner out there. That's my personal opinion. Hey. Thank you. Anybody else have on anything on the board? Well, as Jason said, we've debated it back and forth, and um, timing, as I heard earlier this evening, relative to our building in the center of town, is uh, always a factor. And given the timing of when this may come around and when we're trying to appropriate funds to do it, it may make sense to leave the water division where they are. Um, the town has invested money in the property. The water department has done a good job of setting themselves up efficiently so that they can get at their materials that they need to, that they can access things in an emergency. Um, they still have some other improvements they can do to protect equipment that they have over there. And uh, given the timing and what may or may not be our final hopeful proposal and cost, it may make sense to leave them where they are. So this is why Jason alluded to, we've been discussing it in depth and we're not quite there yet because we really have to focus on what this thing might want to be and what that final structure of this thing might want to be and the dollars are the driving factor mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if I could just uh, kind of stay on that, that train of thought um, I think this board and, and the people in town would, would like to know I have, have a better sense of how the DPW and the water division operate is that they're, they're separate separate divisions right um, in, in separate geographical locations but do they share equipment during a snowstorm and if they do so now they now they'll be sharing a, a wash down area so there's there's a there's a really good case that that could be made that to have them combined even though we've already spent some some money in, in the other instance and also for administrative reasons all of all people under under one roof we understand why you spent the money at, at Glen Ward because you, you were out of room at the other place so you needed to expand. But for um, the cost of the architect's fees, you can include, it's about what, it's about the same amount for the architect's fees as it is to include the water department. So it makes sense to do it all at once because two years from now, you're going to tell us Glenwood, you, you're, you have growing pains in, in Glenwood. And, and I appreciate that, but again, the numbers are preliminary and the designs are preliminary and we still have a lot more to shake out. And right now it looks like for the cost of the architectural fees later on, it might look like something a little, a little different. We're not there yet. It, right. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that's mm -hmm. preliminary. And I will say just broadly for everyone else, uh, I'm sure is going to have something to say, but uh, presentation, very good. From you folks, uh, and I'm glad the DPW is doing 
the need study. That's very important to, to assess what you have, assess what your needs are now, and, and, and look to the future. So, you know, I, I hope the public appreciates this step. Uh, I know we appropriated the money at town meeting to do this, uh, but it's it's from you folks bringing it up in the first place. And the other thing too, you can look at on all this project as well as uh, police and fire. One other cost savings you could um, get is I know everybody talks about we need a facilities manager for the town. If you hire a facilities manager before the project start, they could act as the OPM for the project as well, eliminating a lot of that cost to the town. And then knowing all these facilities in the end, like the back of his hand, he'll have he'll know everything about the HVAC system for all three buildings or two, whatever number of buildings. He'll know what the roof is, what who put it in, what's the material type, who do I need to call to get a repair. He's going to have it all in his filing cabinet right from the start, from day one, when he's, when he's when he takes over the buildings from the contractor. That's an excellent point. That uh, mm -hmm. I, I think we should all keep in mind. That's an excellent point. You, the clerk you, of the works, the clerk of the works for this project, the police, the fire station, the community, yeah. all the buildings that we do. If if they do happen, all in a row. It, but even if they don't happen, all I mean, not in a bad way. I mean, there isn't a lot of pre-planning on when roofs need to be replaced on all the town public buildings. You know, to start having somebody that's here full time that's cataloging every piece of it, every the buildings are the most precious infrastructure we have, the most expensive. And to have that person in here getting paid realistically peanuts compared to what you're going to pay an OPM, uh, you know, one year of OPM services is three years of a guy's salary. And I know there's other things associated <coughs> with that salary and whatnot, but the, the, it's, a, it's it'd be huge for the town, long term yeah. and short term. And the other thing about this is uh, the, we haven't gone back and forth on uh, whether or not the water department and the DPW should be together. I believe they should be, number one. I believe the public, it would be more accessible for the public to go there in case we move our office staff down there. I mean, to send people out to Glenwood Road to talk about water bill, I'd rather see them go to a, a site where there's the office staff. If that portion of that building gets built, that someone can go in there and know where it is, the main roads, not out in the woods, and and be taken care of. Um, and yes, I, I do think paying for it once instead of down the road rehabbing an older structure when it's best to fail. Mm -hmm. Because you could have that snowstorm in those buildings down there that have been down there for years. And they were from the cranberry owner before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I tend to think that we should, if we're going to do it, and if if, if that's the, the uh, choice of the time, I think we should do it once. And I think they should be together somehow on that side. The other thing, too, to note, we are already have eliminated, by our choice, putting our administrative staff down there, the two administrative assistants that work in the office. Um, if you guys think we should have them down there, we'd re-entertain it, but for my perspective, and I believe the other two board members, having them here in town hall to me is a bigger benefit than any benefit of having them off-site. I mean, maybe space-wise it might be a benefit, but for working and getting you know permits done or something like that, I I, I wouldn't want to be the person that's up here at town hall saying, "Oh, you got to go down to you know Mattakesa Street if you want to get that permit signed today." And, and oh, where she at the Glenwood Road. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. You, you had some town, questions. Town Hall is the, the place for those folks. Uh, you had some questions. Yeah. Does um, the proximity to Big Sandy factor into this at all? You've got the uh, reservoir across the street. For the wash station. Yeah. I but mean, that's right now you don't have a wash station, so right. the wash station will actually improve things. Okay. <laughs> um, because in that's part of the year water, the water trucks will have to go over and get washed down after the snowstorms. Yeah. Right, right now we're in violation. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's overall a tremendous benefit of building a new building because all of your equipment is now housed inside. You don't have equipment outside that could have drips and leaks and spills. Everything since inside gets collected through a tight tank system. It does not enter the stormwater system. Uh, the fluids are all stored in accordance with today's regulations. Separate uh, rated rooms with uh, spill prevention. So just by nature of meeting the building code, 
uh, in today's standards, this site would be a tremendous improvement to uh, the overall in, in and site design, you'll have oil water separators on, right. in the stormwater system Correct. outside, too. Right. Um, there. Do you, do you have any input into this, uh, Gene? Uh, find whichever way the town decides to go. Yeah. The facility, whether it's the water combined or it isn't. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just have a few questions. Currently, we use a lot of subcontracted snow plowers. Yep. So you talk about more efficiency with this one, one building. What are the cost savings you predict? For efficiencies on, on, on plowing? I don't know. That's another topic for another time that I forgot to bring the proposal along. We got approval from advisory um, to implement a snow operations program <coughs> software. Um, but I need to have to come to you guys about about spending the money, having that time. Um, but that's our move. That in, in, as far as snow optimization, that's our goal. There is to implement a um, a um, operational software to track the um, contractors and staff, um, and also will give us the ability to push button to do our FEMA reports if we need to. It'll give us the most expensive 24 hours of any storm. Um, and also be able to tell us the cost of every storm as soon as the storm's over. The next day I can give you a report on how much we spent on the storm. Um, with a click of a, a click of a button. So that's our goal there. It's just, it's on my list of things to do. We got, like I said, I know advisory's here and they did approve it um, on their end. They just needed to come here and get you guys approval. Can I just follow up yeah. with that a little further? Yeah. So can you just explain for, for the board and, and, and the people listening? Your snow operations, just just briefly. So, since we have our own equipment and we have subcontractors, is is that how most towns in, in the South Shore operate? Yeah. Yes. You don't have enough manpower. Right. And no town does. No, no town. town does. Nobody. Nobody doesn't use outside. I shouldn't right. say it, Gene. I don't know why anybody that doesn't have outside contractors, right? Wellesley, Wellesley Weston. Plus the, plus the other I don't thing. even think, I, I would guarantee you if I ever did yeah. have outside contractors. Plus right. the other thing that's not taken into consideration, when the police department or the fire department calls and they say it's just three out and we salted, <clears throat> we have to salt the whole thing. We just can't go salt the area which they call it. Uh, just in case someone gets in an accident someplace else and we have not addressed it. So for the most part, when we're called out to do salting, uh, we salt the whole time. Okay. Yep, and, and I just wanted to bring it up so that, uh, you know, uh, no one's really thinking about snow now, but because we're talking about the DPW, I want to make sure that everyone knows that uh, the way this town is operated is is the norm for for every other town in the area. Well, that's why we kind of went to the bigger trucks, too, to carry more salt, be able to follow heavier storms, and to move quicker. Uh, you know, and try to take and eliminate some of the contractors that do that. But that's kind of the way we would kind of propose to go. Yeah, question. I had a few more questions, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. Follow that up. You mentioned that some, some of the public comes down to your current facility down on Mattachisa Street. How often does the public come out there? I don't think the public probably ever comes up to Mattachisa Street. Nowhere to come out of Kisa? Not often at all. Maybe to get salt and sand out in front. Outside the gates. Yeah, outside the gates, but I don't, I mean, you, you, you guys would be the one that don't want to well, one think, person a week, it's a busy day. Yeah. I think they're so used to coming here. Yeah, the business yeah. is, the business end is conducted yeah. here. Yeah. <coughs> and lastly, this is mostly for you, Jason, but I had some questions about uh, the water in our town. So after we close out this discussion, would you mind sticking around and we can move sure. my discussion of that forward a little bit? If that'd be all right with you, Mr. Chairman? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nope. The only other comment I would have, it's an excellent presentation. I think it clearly spells out the need that, that you're presenting to us. Again, it's, it's funds and I think I think we all know that. So if we could, we've got to really get a handle on where any money is that we could lay our hands on to help offset the cost of this. Um, it, it still might end up being an override deal, but if there was grant money available somewhere, 
uh, that would offset the cost. And uh, so I, you know, just wanted to point that out. I think that's obvious. I think everybody knows that. I don't, I don't think anybody wants their taxes to go up, but um, you can just see Pembroke moving from the bedroom community into a bigger town. I mean, it's not 7,000 people anymore, you know, there's, you know, 20,000 people and there's, there's um, a lot of services that have to be provided in all the departments. The police need people, the fire department needs people, you guys definitely need people. Um, and facilities, there's no doubt about that. The school has their needs and um, everybody else in town has their needs. It's, it's, um, it's probably, what we're gonna have to do is probably do an override somehow to take care of all of this stuff. And if we had more people like Barbara Case that was here earlier that, that could help out with that, with all the money aspect of it and how you do that, that would be great. So it's definitely not my expertise, but. So have you any thoughts if, if we were to have a full build out of your staffing levels, if you would have to increase staff? Or are you looking? Oh, you mean full build out of the town? Well, full, build, full build out from this presentation. Uh, I know this is to house the equipment, but is there a staffing aspect to this as well that you're thinking of? Currently, no. We, we were focused on the needs for the structure and what we do and how we do it because the DPW of today, things are changing so quickly as we all know. Technology is changing daily. The DPW of today, 10 to 15 years from now is going to be a different DPW and that's one of the challenges that we're looking at is, is what we think is going to happen, what we think equipment-wise is going to change. Um, there's already equipment out there now that, that are, that are uh, multi-source equipment where you buy one, I'll call it, trailer truck, and everything attaches to that and can get taken off and put on dump bodies, sanders, plows, it's just, but it's one mechanical piece and all the other pieces get attached to it. We're somewhat at that level. Um, and the staffing aspect, again, we outsource some of the things that we just don't have the equipment and manpower to do presently. And um, we don't envision that thing expanding rapidly at this point. It'll be more of filling positions where people will be retiring. Okay. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? No, I think we um, we know that we get a pretty good bang for our buck from the uh, DPW as it stands now, but they do face um, the issue of having you know an old facility and. Um, you know, Western Sampson is, is um, you know, kind of the authority on, on what you need and, uh, you know, how to set it up. So, um, I, I think you're headed in the right direction. I hope we can support you uh, in the future. And um, I, I think we um, agree with you as far as uh, the need existing. Is there something else that you need from us tonight? No. Um, Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, we appreciate you. your time. It's a very good um, explanation of what's going on. Thank you. Okay. Next up on. Thank you. Um, do you want to talk about um, your issue for a minute while we're still here? Or? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So Jason, I have a question for you. I don't know how um, well versed you are in the current water situation in the town. I'm not asking you to have any of these answers. I wasn't even expecting you to be here tonight when I first put this before the board. And later learned that you were coming. So I thought, why not just ask these questions now and not have you come back later? That's fine. So current. Answer what I will. Thank you. So on May 3rd, the Patriot Ledger published an article in which they said that. Pembroke was currently over the action levels of both copper and lead in our water. 
you know what action we're taking, or, or if that's true, first of all, and what action we're taking, if it is true? I would lean on Scott, I think he just walked out. Um, I do not believe we are, is that at the schools? No, I don't believe it's on the, in our um, community base. Um, and what you'll find in a lot of those school situations, and again, hopefully they'll come back in, um, in a school basis, what you'll find is they don't properly flush before they um, take the samples. And so you'll have water that sits in the pipes for days and days and days, and, and it will eventually reach out lead and copper, um, and it will you'll have a high level in, in the, uh, the water at that point. I believe we are meeting it at all the homeowner facilities, though. I believe it is just a um, school-based situation, and if it is, there's nothing we can do about it. We are already um, doing corrosion control, um, which is the only thing you can do to eliminate the issue. It's not in the water, it's in the pipes. It's in the pipes in the buildings themselves. It's not in, it's not in the pipes in the ground, it's in the pipes in the buildings. Oh, I see. Thank you. And is it possible to get a report on any sort of chemicals in the water? It's in the, um, you just got in the mail. Your, um, it's, it's on the website support. too. Yeah. yeah. But you just got, you just, yeah, I literally got mine last week. Consumer right. Conference Ooh, Report. It has it in there, and if I had one, I could tell you what it says on lead and copper, because that's in there. Um, I lead and rock copper results are in the Consumer Conference Report. And I am 99% sure we do not have a lead and copper issue in, in our lead and copper testing. It's other than at the school, correct? Right. Yeah. And our next round of lead and copper is this June. We got 30 samples throughout the town. But we've and never had it. Problem with and what I had said, and you can confirm this, I believe, is what you find in the schools, and what I find in other towns, at least, is in the schools, is they don't properly flush Correct. before they take the samples, and that's what you'll have. The only other one is, you might want to check, and I did this in a town, is the schools can go through and actually check their water bubblers. Um, one town I worked with, they had a hit, and it ended up that the, the water fixture had a lead bladder in it. The, the, the actual a thing that the cools the water was made out of lead. It was from the 1940s. I don't, haven't done an inventory. That would be something that if we had a facilities manager <laughs> would be doing. Um, but that's where you get lead and copper in that. And he's right. In my well, all right. Thank you for clearing that up. No hmm. Especially asking about fluoride. I love fluoride. <laughs> yeah, Should I have asked you about fluoride? Like we're hoping knock on wood, we're going to try and move forward with eliminating fluoride. Why? Save money. And um, potentially, you're basically, we feed it at the correct amounts and, and, it's, and it's designed so that you cannot overfeed the chemical. But fluoride is a poison. What are the pros? Why are we using it now? It's your teeth. That's the only reason. Why? So. Certain parts, of, certain, mm -hmm. certain parts of certain parts of the country, especially in Appalachia, no, no. didn't did have fluoride in the in the foods foodstuffs that they grew locally. So they needed fluoride uh, in, in their bodies. So now that food is grown all over the place and trucked all over the world, you, you don't have that issue anymore. But you have if you're in a town that doesn't, if you're if you have young kids, they'll tell you to put drops in their um, water. And you go to a dentist. That's what you do for fluoride. Because right now, you, we're putting it into every gallon of water that goes out in the town that then gets sprinkled on lawns and gets put in fertilizer. It goes in people's gardens and whatnot. And it's just a waste of. of can, you, can you tell us when it was implemented? 1969. Pretty so recent. It's going to have to be a. It was a vote. At, the I'm question ready. is I'm going to, I prefer to Ed's attention, ask the question of do we need to go back to town meeting? The town meeting vote was, was to purchase equipment to treat, it wasn't to treat. So the question is, do we have to go back to town meeting to say we want to stop treating or? I think you do. I don't know, it doesn't, I left it to Ed to ask town council that question and we'll would move it hurt, from there. Would it hurt just to put it on town meeting for just to take it? Instead of paying the, the lawyer, just put it on town meeting for it, have the, have the town lawyer on it, and then just remove it if that's the case. Doesn't cost anything. So if you want to eliminate it, I, I just want to make sure you're, you're doing it for, for the right reasons, for, for cost, yeah, for, we, for equipment. We, we've reached out to Board of Health too, and we're going to meet, I'm going to meet the Board of Health on it. The Board of Health is actually the people who put the article yeah. out originally in 1969. And, and the reason I say it like that is because uh, so some people take that topic 
and make it uh, like the antibiotics and the vaccinations. I don't want it to be about that. And that's, to be honest with you, that's the only reason why if we can not bring it to town meeting floor, I wouldn't and have people come to our meeting. I'd have a public hearing at our meeting versus tie up town meeting floor for an hour debating the, you know, the communists are gonna come and get us because we have gotta take away fluoride. We are going to fluoride. Right. If you're going to do it for the right reasons. Yes. Which we are. I mean, that in the end, it's for saving money and also potential health risks that are, could be, there are studies out there that document that even drinking it in regular amounts. Can so we'll see which four out of five dentists recommend. We'll all recommend to keep it clear. <laughs> <laughs> what other chemicals are we putting in the water? Uh, we put in corrosion control. Which is we do potassium hydroxide and chlorine. Chlorine is filtration plant. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Else? That's it for me. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you all.